women in politics is what we're talking about this week. We thought this would be topical after last week's big US election excitement, which saw a record number of women elected, which is awesome. Good job, US voters there. Although it probably doesn't do that much, unfortunately, to improve your world ranking for the percentage of women in government, which, as of September 2012, was 80th, tied with Morocco and Venezuela at 17%. Don't worry, we're not doing much better here in the UK. We are 58th, tied with Malawi, at 22.3%. Rwanda are at number one with 56.3% of women making up their government, which is the only country, the first and only country in the world to have a majority of women in government. The global average is about 19.8% now, I think. So nearly 20%, which is quite frankly a bit piss poor. I'll put a link in the description to the table where I got these figures for anyone who wants to look up their country. So why is it such a problem that there are so few women in government across pretty much the entire world? In democratic representative governments, the idea is that everyone gets together and votes for who they want to represent them in the in government. In the UK, that's your MP. And obviously, not everyone's favourite candidate will win, so not everyone will be represented by the person who they would prefer to be represented by. When you're looking at an area of voters, the ties of a town or a city, you're going to have a whole range of people voting and only one person who gets to represent them. Now, obviously, that means that we can't ever have a situation where everyone's going to be represented by someone who has the exact same life experience as them or is from the exact same demographic as them. But regardless, it shouldn't matter whether you're being represented by someone from the same demographic as you, because even if they're not who you prefer, that person is still there to represent their constituents' best interests. They're still there to represent your best interests. So theoretically, it shouldn't matter if you're not represented by a woman or from someone from the same ethnicity as you or someone from the same class as you and so on. And as it must be pointed out, women members of parliament don't always act in what is considered the best interests of women. In the UK, for example, we have MPs like Nadine Doris and Maria Miller who want to push for a lowering of the abortion limit from 24 weeks where it is now down to 20 weeks or even lower. Being a woman does not necessarily make you a feminist, but this does become a problem when the breakdown of the demographics in government as a whole don't adequately represent the breakdown of the demographics in the country. For example, when the majority of those in Parliament are white, middle class, privately educated, able-bodied cis men. And this isn't just a problem because all oh, evil white middle class men ruining everything for everyone else. This would be a problem regardless of who the consolidated group in power were. If everyone in power has the same very, very narrow set of life experiences, then it is simply going to be limiting to what they can understand about the needs of people outside of those experiences. Having a majority white government will never be able to fully understand the consequences of racism and the extent of racism in this country. Having a majority male government will never be able to understand the consequences of sexism and the extent to which sexism is still prevalent in this country. Having a majority middle and upper class government will never be able to understand what it's like for working class families. You need people with a variety of experiences who are going to be able to contribute different perspectives to any issues that you're discussing. And this is always going to create a problem when you're trying to decide on policies and there's no one there in the room who has that lived experience to say, uh, actually, this is a really bad idea. This is going to like make life really difficult for a lot of people. And it's also worth noting that of the women who do make it to Parliament, many of those women are still white middle class or upper class, privately educated or well-educated, able-bodied, cis. So their outlook on life and their experience and their the way they think is going to be much closer to the white middle class men who, they, who are with them in Parliament than it is to, for example, a working class woman or a woman of colour or a trans woman. So how do we change this and why is it that there are so few women in government? Well, as with most of the issues we discussed, there is really no simple answer. You can look at the way that politics is often portrayed as a man's job, from the lack of role models that young girls have to look up to that makes them think that, hey, maybe they might want to go into politics when they get older. A lack of representation perpetuates a lack of representation. Politics is also a field that predominantly places value on personality traits and attributes traditionally socialised as male, rather than those traditionally socialised as female. So for example, men are encouraged to be leaders, to be aggressive, to be forthright, 
and confident in their opinions. Whereas women are taught much more to question their opinions, to be agreeable, to be quiet, to not put themselves forward. And this, in turn, contributes to another problem, which is that women are seen as bad at leadership, unreliable, not cut out for politics, not aggressive enough, not forthright enough, not confident enough, but emotional, irrational, hysterical, can't, I, I, I can't have a woman representing me in parliament. What will happen when it's this time of the month? What will happen if she gets pregnant and her hormones are playing up? No one would ever ask a male politician who has children how he balances work and family life in a way that portrays him as a bad father for having a job which keeps him away from home for a lot of the time. But for a woman, that's, oh no, how do you do that? Because women are seen as primary caregivers, regardless of what the actual situation in their family is. This is the sort of thing that people think, and this is the, one of the reasons that women struggle to get elected and struggle to get leadership positions. It's even when people aren't consciously sexist and say, oh no, I have no problem with women being in power. There is a subconscious bias which people don't acknowledge. And this has been seen in studies of other traditionally male fields of work, so for example science or management, that if you present the same CV to someone for promotion or for a raise or for a, man a management position and put a woman as the gender on one CV and put a man as the gender on the other CV, then th th people will unconsciously make up reasons why they don't think the woman is suitable with the exact same qualifications and experience as the male candidate. And finally, I mean, you only have to look at how those women who are in positions of government are treated compared to men in positions of government. People remark on their weight, people remark on their hair, people remark on what they're wearing. People ask like women like Hillary Clinton who their favourite designers are, a question that they would never ask to a male politician. People remark on whether or not they'd want to do them, and all sorts of sexist epithets and slurs are thrown at women in a way that just further undermines women's legitimacy in politics. Which is why it was so brilliant recently when the Australian Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, we had that huge rant that went viral across the internet, basically saying, no, I won't stand for this misogynistic targeting that men don't have to put up with. If you're going to attack women politicians, attack them on their policies, attack them on what they've done, attack them on how they've performed. So how can we change this? Well, one way is, as Julia Gillard did, just to not stand for it, just to not take that type of misogynistic crap and say, no, this is not acceptable. In those countries that have achieved a higher equality of women in parliament, it's normally done through quotas that say you have to have a minimum number of women in certain seats or a minimum number of women in leadership role. And unfortunately, as with most of these things, it's just going to take time. Unless we, you know, completely overthrow the government, we'll have to wait until the next generation, until we have young girls who see politics as a viable career for them. But in the meantime, if you have any other suggestions on how you think we can improve women's representation and participation in politics, then please put them in the comments below. And I will see you next Monday.